Hello everyone. I'm going to be describing a little bit of the most important vocabulary that you need to understand related to this first module. Um, you will note that research is its own language. If you've ever tried to study a new language and learn a new language to get to the level of fluency, you know it's very challenging. So this whole semester you're going to be working on how to become a fluent speaker of research. And so that is what this lecture is going to introduce you to. This is in your textbook. I'm not going to read and review this whole table with you, but I do want to want you to understand that there's a distinction between the words that researchers use, whether they're talking about quantitative or qualitative. So to just explain that further, the person who we are studying, the people who are giving us the information, are called different things depending on whether we're doing quantitative research or qualitative. So you'll see that either of them call the participants participants, but only quantitative researchers call them subjects, which sounds very dry and disconnected, fits perfectly into quantitative, whereas qualitative researchers often call their participants informants because we are getting a much deeper, richer sense of information from our informants in a qualitative study. And so you'll see other terms here. Obviously there is a distinction between the type of data we're getting in quantitative versus qualitative. In quantitative studies, we're going to get data that can be turned into numbers. Sometimes we're getting numbers directly. So if we're, if we're trying to measure hemoglobin A1C levels, we're going to get lab reports that give us that data already in numerical form. But sometimes we're collecting number, data on things that aren't numbers. So we have to be able to turn them into numbers in quantitative data. So an example of that would be asking someone what kind of um, nurse they are, what specialty are, do you work in? So I might would have to code that. So if you work in the emergency department, I could code it as a one. If you work in intensive care, adult intensive care unit, two. If you work in a medical surgical, three, et cetera. But somehow I have to turn my data into numbers. Qualitative research, on the other hand, is not numerically inclined. We're going to have a wealth of information. If I do a 30 minute interview of someone, I have to transcribe all of their recorded information into text so that I have page upon page of narrative data that I have to look at. So you can imagine if you're interviewing 20 people and their each interview is 30 minutes to an hour in length, you've got potentially thousands of pages of data to read and soak, soak up so that you can understand the participant's story. Now one thing I do want to want you to pay attention to is this deductive versus inductive and I'm going to show you what that means here with some examples. It's important to get this distinction because this really kind of sums up the big differences between quantitative and qualitative. Deductive is kind of a top-down approach. So an example, we know that post-op patients are at high risk for DBTs. That's just a general principle that we expect to be true. So taking that expected general principle, we could then ask the question specifically, which form of DVT prophylaxis would work best to prevent DVTs? Would it, whether it be pro, uh, prophylactic pharmacologic, like Lovenox or something like that, or whether it be mechanical, like TED hose or sequential compression devices, okay? So we take a principle that we know to be true for the general population and we decrease our focus to ask a specific question using that general principle. Inductive, on the other hand, is we're making observations of people that we're studying and trying to induce what that would look like for the bigger population. For example, you interview several parents who have just completed an adoption. So this is a specific small group, maybe 10 parents. And you, un you understand what that decision-making process for adoption looked like for those 10 people so that then you could induce what it would look like to the general population. So going from a small group of interviewees to a big group of the overall population, that's what inductive reasoning looks like. And I have a couple of other examples here if you want to pause and read through that, but we're going to move on. Also, just know that study site is an important thing to pay attention to. 
for the most part, we're moving more and more toward more multi-site studies because that gives us a better understanding of what a broader group of people look like. So for example, if I went to one hospital unit in one hospital and I asked nurses about their experiences of burnout, do you think that that really is going to explain what nursing burnout looks like for all nurses in the United States or the world for that matter? Absolutely not. To make a stronger study, we typically like to see multi-site studies. It might be multi-state, so we might have people from Louisiana, Arizona, Illinois, Florida, Washington. Or sometimes we have international studies that might look at United States, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea. That gives us a diverse population of a sample of people we're looking at so that we can hopefully have better findings that would apply to a much bigger group of people than if we were just looking at one small hospital, one small unit. Also note that qualitative researchers typically go to where the people are. So if I'm studying nursing home residents, I'm going to be doing field work in the nursing home, going there to talk to the residents. Whereas quantitative researchers typically like to con collect data in a very controlled setting. Um, one other thing to clarify for you before we finish this presentation is the distinction between concepts and constructs. Your textbook does talk about this, but I did want to give you some more examples to help it make more sense. Concepts and constructs are typically what we're interested in studying in quantitative research. Concepts also can translate over to qualitative too, but this is kind of like the meat and potatoes of what are we studying? What do we want to learn about? So concepts, concepts are abstract, but they can be measured or described kind of easily. So for pain, we have measurement skills that we use as nurses to collect data on pain. Weight, that's a pretty easy concept. We could say that perhaps that is the weight on in kilograms or pounds, but we can describe weight. Constructs are even more abstract. So health, what does that even mean? There's so many different definitions and ways to think about health that you could really get out in the weeds on some of these definitions. So oftentimes the researchers are having to define what health means to them in their study and that's why it's called a construct. They are kind of making up their own definition of what that word's going to mean in their study so that it may be different from other researchers views of health. So here's an example. A phenomenon is something I've seen in my own practice. This is definitely something that we've probably a lot of us have seen. New graduate nurses typically struggle. They struggle during that first year of practice as they integrate into the nursing role. We know that, we've seen that. The concept name for that would be role transition stress. So if I were doing a study about this first year of practice transition, I would have to define for you, the reader, what role transition stress means so that we would both be on the same page when you're reading my manuscript. Another example, we know, especially if you've worked in a hospital for any length of time, you know that patients get bottlenecked in the emergency waiting room or in the emergency um, department waiting for a room to open up in an inpatient unit. There's so many reasons for that, but we know that that concept is called patient throughput or, emer or ED throughput. So I would have to explain to you what that means. And then this is lastly an article that I actually got to publish, yay, and it's a concept analysis. Basically, I wanted to go through the literature that had been, had been published on imposterism or the post imposter phenomenon to understand exactly what it means so I could have a good clear-cut definition for it. And as you see down here, I actually created a concept definition from the literature that views imposterism as a subjective, inaccurate self-assessment um, involving feelings of intellectual and professional incompetence and fraudulence despite external evidence of success. So I didn't make that up. I found it in the literature and I condensed all of these 70 something studies into that one definition and that it was my concept. And I plan to study this further. So I've now defined the concept and now I can study it by collecting data either through qualitative or quantitative studies. 
So those are just a few vocabulary words you need to have an understanding of as you move forward into other modules and other readings.